Hi, welcome to the Getting Started video for the Connect for Windows device support in Nevron Motion version 1 for Lightwave 11.6 and higher. The Connect for Windows sensor is slightly different than the Xbox 360 Connect sensor. The Microsoft Redistributable Driver version 1.7 supports only the Connect for Windows sensor. There is no current support for OS X with this sensor, and you may use Boot Camp to run Windows OS on your Mac hardware or you may use a Windows, Windows OS virtual machine but you must realize that the Kinect sensor only works under the Windows environment. If you do use a virtual machine make sure your system is fast enough since body tracking does use many resources. Now you may use up to four Kinect for Windows devices on your system and each of these can connect up to two skeletons but these two skeletons will be distinct from one another the system does not merge the skeletons representing the same real world object. Now you're looking at me through the Connect for Windows sensor right now. But let's back up and see how we got here. Alright, let's get started. Connect the power cord from your Connect for Windows sensors to your power source. Connect the USB cord from your Connect for Windows sensor into an open USB port on your Windows OS system. Try to use a USB 2 channel that is devoted to the sensor because it may not work well sharing the available bandwidth with other devices. Within layout, open the device manager panel. The device manager must be active. The connect for windows manager must be enabled before any connect sensors are available within layout. If Navron Motion is not licensed properly, the manager description will appear in red. Here we see a Kinect sensor available. The name of the device appears in the first column. The default name is based on a sensor-specific identity. The Kinect for Windows sensors all have the identity with a bunch of zeros for now. And you may wish to rename this device. To do this, double-click the name and enter a new name. We recommend Kinect underscore A, Kinect underscore B, etc. This is so that Virtual Studio can refer to the device in a consistent manner when sharing your content with other users. For now, let's see what the sensor sees. Enable the sensor device you wish to use. The status column will show ready when it is actually operating. Now there are times when it may not become ready when enabled or that it may take a few seconds before responding. If it doesn't become enabled, try again. You may try to disable and re-enable the device. Under rare circumstances, you may need to restart layout or even your computer system. But always check your physical connections first, though. Open the Device Options panel. The sensor has a motor that controls the tilt. This can control the tilt vertically, plus or minus 27 degrees from center. As I change it, it'll take a little while for it to respond. Use sparingly as the motor may wear sooner than expected. The accelerometer data indicates which direction gravity is relative to the sensor, and this is for informational purposes only. The IR toggle lets you see the infrared lighting as a grayscale image. This is primarily only useful to notice if unwanted infrared light sources may be conflicting. Conflicts can cause inaccurate tracking. The mirror toggle flips horizontally the coordinate data seen in this panel and the resulting data tracks. The near mode is useful when it can find spaces. The sensor's depth buffer will be adjusted for near subjects. Use only as needed. The audio toggle enables audio capabilities, which currently affect the audio peak, source angle, source confidence, and beam angle. The color camera on the Connect for Windows sensor can use some adjustments as well. This button in the upper right hand corner of your options panel brings up a separate panel in which you can control the white balance, exposure levels. Let's play with a few of these now. Here's the white balance the hue, contrast, saturation, gamma, and sharpness. We can set that back to auto, and then we can start to play with the exposure. This can be useful when trying to accommodate certain lighting situations when doing face tracking. Let's go back to defaults. 
The skeleton's toggle determines if any body tracking or face tracking is going to be used. Faces can only be tracked if an associated body skeleton is also being tracked. Each person being tracked has a unique tint. In this case, I'm blue. In this case, I'm red. In this case, I'm cyan. In this case, I'm magenta. Up to six persons can be tracked, but only two of them can have skeletons and faces. Let's enable skeletons. The skeleton is shown in the tint of the tracked person. Darker lines are best guesses even though not directly tracked. For example, my legs are being inferred as best guesses, and as I move further into frame, they are being directly tracked. The person closest to the sensor is considered skeleton zero, followed by skeleton one and so on to skeleton five. Only skeleton zero and one can have skeletons tracked. When only the upper body of a subject is available, use the seated toggle. Let me get a chair to demonstrate. Well, now I'm in a chair and I've turned green. This means I'm a different skeleton identity than I was before. However, I'm still going to be referred to as skeleton zero because I'm still the skeleton closest to the camera and the only one. Now you notice that it's trying to guess where my legs are and I don't think it's going to come up with a very good guess because they're very far from the frame here. So we go to a seated mode which basically turns off those uh, the legs and the torso. So now it's refound my skeleton and I'm a new color and you'll see that I only have arms and my head. Now skeleton tracking with this sensor naturally produces rather jittery raw results until they are smoothed or filtered out. There are some smoothing presets but you can adjust the individual settings as needed. In an unfiltered situation, all these parameters are set to zero. And if I try to hold still, you can see that the skeleton kind of jitters around, con continuously making adjustments. So let's get out of this chair and I can demonstrate these a little bit better for you. For better demonstration of what the skeleton looks like relative to the raw data, I've turned off the lights. Luckily, body tracking only requires the infrared light coming from the Kinect sensor. Now with an unfiltered skeleton, if I try to hold still, it's not too bad, but the skeleton will be jittering around slightly. And when you're in your 3D environment, you will notice these values much greater. Now let's go to a very smooth set of settings. And you can see that my raw data leads the skeleton pretty drastically. However, if I hold stationary, the skeleton will be pretty solid. But the latency is just too much to deal with. So we'll have to deal with some happy compromise. That's what the default... This is what the default settings are for. The exact meaning of smoothing, correction, prediction, jitter radius, and maximum deviation radius are available in your documentation. The faces toggle enables facial tracking for a skeleton. Now this won't work very well in low light situations like now, so we'll have to turn the lights back on. Alright, the lights are back on, and you can see my skeleton, so let's enable faces. I've enabled the faces, and you can see it has put a wireframe mesh and a white box around my face. And if I move my head too far away from the camera, it loses track of my face. So I do have to be facing the camera pretty straightly. But it does offer a little bit of motion with your head uh, heading and pitch. And it also knows roughly the size of your head. Now the faces are continually refined. There are measurements of the face that are expected to be consistent for the subject, such as the head shape. Now these are called shape units. There are also measurements that change often, such as the lips and the eyebrows. These are called animation units. Please see the written documentation for what the meaning of the shape and animation units are. Now face tracking can also be jittery until smoothed. And as smoothing is increased, the latency also increases. So let's get a little closer. So you can see some more detail with the face. Now for this I'd like to use my seated skeleton 
and also go into near mode so I can get a little closer to the camera. And then once the skeleton is being tracked, the face can also be tracked. So let's increase the smoothing. In an extreme example, my mouth is moving fast, but the wireframe representation of it takes a while to catch up. This is the latency. Although the face has been smoothed out greatly, it's lagging too far behind. So let's choose something like 2. Not too bad. And of course, the closer you are to the camera without getting too close, the more detail it can pick up about your face. You'll have to be careful about some obstructions to your face, like costumes, facial hair. In this case, it does pretty well with my facial hair. And I am also wearing glasses. So let's take off the glasses. And you can see how it can track my eyebrows closer. Now sometimes it picks up the wrong kind of face, it's, it's the wrong shape, it's just not what you expect, and as it continually refines, it's still getting it wrong. The Reset Faces button allows you to start over from scratch. Okay, in this situation, I've turned on the IR representation, I've also turned on audio, and you can see my skeleton. When you click on the name in the device manager of the device, you'll see the data tracks available for it. Here we see the audio tracks, followed by skeleton zero tracks, which deal with the, the joint structure. And if I scroll down, we can see the face pose and the animation units and shape units. The shape units are continually refined. It may be zero for a few faces. Now notice I'm using the infrared camera representation, which is not a good image for face tracking. So you really want to use IR off and then get a better representation. The data tracks as you scroll down represent skeleton zero, then one, then two through five. Notice two through five only have tracking status as well as position. Now the sensor does pretty well for looking at skeletons for front-on view of the person. However, if I start to cross over my arms or cross over my legs or start to spin around, it has to make some best guesses which are not always accurate. So it's best if you're going to be performing from the sensor to try to do a front-on approach and without much crossover of the arms. If I'm moving my arms frequently, it can infer a better guess than if I do a slow and stationary crossover. Well, thank you for watching the Connect for Windows Device Options Panel Getting Started Guide. Till next time.